Cooper on behalf of the state. William J. for the state. James Owens on behalf of Sarah Boone. Tony Henderson on behalf of Sarah Boone. I do. Ma'am, good morning. Can you state your full name and date of birth for the record for me? Sarah Boone, 101077. All right, Ms. Boone is seated at council's table wearing a gray suit and a white blouse. She is out of custody and unshackled. Uh, Mr. Beck, you arrived late, sir. Can I get your appearance for the record, please? Yes, sir. I'm Kevin Beck on behalf of Sarah All right, thank you. All right, we're here on a litany of different matters, uh, multiple motions in limine. Uh, the state's motion in limine to exclude battered spouse syndrome evidence or exclude mention of battered spouse syndrome evidence until the defendant testifies to a justifiable use of deadly force filed October 6. Defendant's response to state's motion in limine to exclude battered spouse syndrome evidence or mention of battered spouse syndrome evidence until defendant testified files filed October 15th. And then the defendant's amended response to same also filed October 15th. The defendant's motion in limine filed October 6th. The state's response to same filed October 6th. State's motion, objection and motion in limine to exclude decedent's medical records filed October 14th. And then the party's objections with regard to specific exhibits that may be sought to be entered uh, at trial. The court has reviewed everything and reviewed all of your case law uh, and we're ready to proceed. Uh, I believe we should probably proceed first on the battered spouse motions first. So state, uh, you may begin. And I also have reviewed as well the excerpts of the deposition of both Dr. Warner and Dr. Harper as identified in the state's motion. Your Honor, for the record, I'm having Madam Clerk mark A, B, and C for identification purposes for this hearing. A is a copy of the defendant's statements that she made on body-worn camera uh, to Deputy Sheriff Kayla Rodriguez on February 24th of 2020, as well as the interview that she provided to Detectives Copsell and Lowen on February 24th, 2020, and February 25th of 2020. It is an identical exhibit as to what was provided to the court uh, for review in chambers as a courtesy before the motion to suppress statements, as well as what is entered into evidence for that motion to suppress statements hearing that was held. They would move A for identification purposes in as one for the purposes of this hearing. Responses to what was pre-marked as A. No objection. All right, what was pre-marked as states A will be received without objection as states 1. B for identification for purposes of this hearing is the deposition of Dr. Harper. We would move that into evidence as states 2 for the purposes of this hearing. Any objection? No objection. All right, what was pre-marked as B will be received without objection as states 2. C for identification for purposes of this hearing is the deposition of Dr. Werner. State would move that into evidence as state three for the purposes of this hearing. Any objection? All right, what was pre-marked as state C will be received without objection. 
as states three. So your honor is familiar with all those exhibits um, and has been able to review them prior to the hearing. So I will just proceed to legal argument. You may proceed. Your honor, this is a motion to eliminate. We are asking for a pretrial ruling based on the proffered statements that the defendant has made, which should in good faith and reliance uh, the state should be able to assume that that will be her testimony at trial, given that her latest version of events was just given to our expert last week. So we are asking for a pretrial ruling on if that is the evidence that comes in at trial, will she get a self-defense instruction? Will she be able to then open the door to all the things that come with self-defense, such as reputation evidence um, of the victim, for being violent, which she may or may not be aware of, that's not required under the law, or prior instances of violence between she and the victim, or the victim and anybody that she is aware of, because that goes to the reasonableness of her perception of an imminent threat of death or great bodily harm. We are not asking um, to not uh, uh, be allowed to talk about these things during voir dire. The defense cited uh, numerous cases and, and spent some of their time in their response um, about the ability to voir dire that. That was not the purpose of our motion. I don't think we mentioned voir dire. Um, because we understand that the defendant can, like any other witness, change her story uh, again. So we understand that we both, on both sides, uh, we, we intend on spending a great deal of, of time on it uh, as well for the state of Florida. Uh, we need to explore these issues during jury selection. But what we are asking from the court now, preliminarily, is if that is what the defendant is going to say in trial, and I'm not asking the court to make any credibility determinations about one version or another. We're asking you to treat this just like a C4 motion or a motion for summary judgment in a civil case. If this is what she says, does this amount to what they are asking for legally? And it's the state's position under the case law that no. Because under her statements that she gave to the experts, there was no overt act uh, taken by the decedent on that day. There was no overt action. And that's what's required under the law to trigger her response of acting in self-defense. Um, there was nothing uh, creating an imminent fear of death or great bodily harm to her until she committed two forcible felonies and a non-forcible felony. What her testimony was is, we were having a good day now, what's different, and again, we don't, we're, we're not asking you to make a credibility determination about what's different, but what is, what is different than what you had heard at the motion to suppress is, we were having a good day, but I'm on edge every day uh, because of past instances of violence, including an instance uh, the night before. Uh, but we were having a good day. We're out on the porch. There's a dartboard out there. Uh, there's puzzles that we're doing. We're doing arts and crafts. We're doing everything uh, to, to keep him preoccupied so he doesn't get sad or upset. Um, interjecting with some phone calls to his family, which she knows would potentially upset him, but that's her testimony. Um, and then eventually, it comes to a point in time where they're sitting on the couch, and he reaches over to her and says, tag your it. And she apparently runs up to the shower to hide, and. He apparently gets into the suitcase to hide, and it's not clear who's it. Eventually, she comes down out of the shower after she says she was getting cold up there and sees him in the suitcase and zips him up. And at the time that she zips the suitcase, what she describes is nearly entirely shut, but you two fingertips could get out. Mind you, a 103-pound man, um, two fingertips. They're laughing. They're, it's all fun and games still. There's still no overt act taken by the decedent during this entire calendar day uh, to, to put anybody in reasonable fear, objectively reasonable in fear of imminent harm, of great bodily harm or death. And it's only when he begins to say, after she has zipped him up into the suitcase, again, she is saying that she did not have malintent at that time, when he starts to say, I cannot breathe, 
Now she describes to the doctors that she does have bad intent, and she wants him to feel what she has felt in the past. She gets angry, is her description. She shakes the suitcase, she beats it, it falls over, it flips over, he sticks his fingertips out, she hits him with a bat. So she's now the initial aggressor, and we'll discuss jury instructions as we get closer, um, but she's the initial aggressor, and she has now committed forcible felonies, aggravated assault, and aggravated battery, stating that I only intended to keep him in there for a couple of minutes, I believed he could get out, she never perceived, according to her, that um, he would uh, die or face great bodily harm. Um, and she just goes upstairs knowing now he's mad because she won't let him out. Now, because of the actions she took as the initial aggressor, she is facing death or great bodily harm uh, from the decedent if he gets out. And she completely expects him to get out because her testimony is that he could get two fingertips out of the zipper. So, Your Honor... Under the law, the state understands. We, we are deeply, deeply um, thoughtful about this request because of um, the risk of error. But this is just one of those cases, like the cases the state cited. There is no self-defense if that is what her testimony is. And therefore, the jury should not uh, hear about uh, any prior instances of violence, any reputation evidence, any battered spouse syndrome, unless and until there is testimony that is self-defense that's recognized under the state of Florida's laws. So what we are asking for is a ruling that if, and this is a motion in limine, and a motion in limine is, hey, this is what's proffered to the court prior to trial. If this is what comes in at trial, this is the court's preliminary ruling unless something changes. What we're asking for is a preliminary ruling that if that is what her testimony is, then not be allowing introduction of past instances of violence, reputation for violence, Go ahead, sir. Uh, or battered spouse syndrome evidence. And furthermore, what the case law supports is our request that clearly this evidence can only come from her. There was nobody else in the apartment or townhouse that night. So she should have to testify before any of those things come in. And she, her testimony should meet the requirements of an overt act um, before any of this testimony comes in. Um, it should not be allowed uh, to, to come in prior to her testimony. And under the case law that the state cited, it's not unfair. It's not forcing her to testify. She chose uh, to raise battered spouse syndrome. The state completely understands we have the burden of disproving self-defense beyond a reasonable doubt. But what the case law says is we shouldn't have to combat this. We can't put the toothpaste back in the tube um, until she actually puts forth the self-defense um, that justifies all this. So that is our request. We're not making any requests about voir dire because we understand she can come in and testify differently yet again at trial. And that's a discussion we'll have to have as well about how that will occur. Um, the state's position is that if she changes her testimony yet again, she should have to give a narrative testimony. Uh, no attorney should be allowed to uh, participate in putting forth new testimony uh, about the events of February 23rd. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Response? Good morning, Judge. Good morning, sir. Uh, I'm a little confused, but I want to make sure so probably can save some time here. My understanding is what the state's saying at this time, that there's no objection to raising this in Bordier to see how the jury would react or their feelings about it. So that's not it. So what, I'm, what that leaves me is... I guess the state's trying to say there should be no mention of uh, battered spouse or anything like that in opening statement. That wasn't my takeaway either. 
my takeaway from the motion and the state's argument today is from a evidence perspective, concepts or testimony or even opinion evidence about the battered spouse syndrome cannot be raised, including any of the reputation or specific instances of conduct that are contemplated by self-defense until there's a factual basis for it. My understanding of the defense's doctor, Dr. Harper's deposition, is that the basis of her opinion, and please correct me if I am wrong, but my understanding is that the basis of Dr. Harper's deposition is based on her four or five interviews or sessions with Ms. Boone as to what transpired on the day and night in question. Is that accurate? I need to confer. Sure. I judge if I could have you repeat that question. Sure. So my understanding, well, let me ask, I'll ask a more of an open-ended question. What is the basis, factually, of Dr. Harper's opinion? So if we were at trial right now, for the purposes of this exercise, and you were going to call Dr. Harper to testify, what is the factual basis component under 90.702 in order to get her to testify. We're not dealing with her CV, her credentials. I'm not sure the state's going to have any position with regard to those. But let's just assume the state has no uh, objection with regard to her credentials and that she is, in fact, an expert based on her knowledge, training, and experience in her field. What is step one under 90.702 to allow her to testify? What is the sufficient factual basis of her opinion? Judge, I think her opinion would be based on several different things. Mainly, one of the things that her opinion would be based on is uh, her interaction over the course of time with our client, Ms. Boone. That's one. But Dr. Harper has also uh, reviewed other evidence in this case uh, that uh, helps her form the basis of her opinion and also her knowledge of battered spouse syndrome. That has to be taken into account because, quite frankly, Judge, people who suffer for things from certain things, they don't know. That's why you have to, like if you have to get an expert opinion as to someone's mental health situation. I mean, a person doesn't really know that they're suffering from a, a mental health problem. Uh, they have no idea in a lot of circumstances. What they do is they get evaluated by a doctor. The doctor has experience of what signs to look for in these things. And, and getting those signs with what they told in outside, outside sources, too. They are able to make a determination based on their training and experience. So, But based on <clears throat> the... A kendo case, which is cited by the state as to what self, uh, what battered spouse is, is it's an ambit of self-defense. So, under the statute, are you traveling under 776.012 as your basis for self-defense? Yes, but this is this is the problem that I'm having here. Self-defense is a defense, it's an affirmative defense that's available to anybody. Uh, it's based on the evidence at trial. But what's the overt act? Because in reviewing Dr. Harper's deposition, there were specific questions by the state inquired of her about the language, specifically in those statutes, about the imminent imminence of fear. And she was unable to answer those questions. So my, 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 my question really is, what's the overt act by the victim which would have given rise to self-defense. Because the case law, taking aside the state's case law under the stand your ground concepts, which I found find distinguishable, because under 776.032, there's a specific 
statutory scheme for pretrial stand your ground motions. So I find those cases distinguishable for that very reason. But there's specific case law, bless you, there's specific case law that talks about in the self-defense realm that the state has cited to in their motion that an overt act is needed. What is the overt act? Judge, the overt act has to come from testimony, and I agree in this case, but what that is has it? to be the testimony of Sarah Boone for that overt act. And that testimony is, can only take place at trial. In making a determination of whether to give the self-defense instruction, it has to be based on the evidence presented at trial. I agree with you on that. I completely agree with you on that. And the case law is clear that if even there's a scintilla of evidence, I have to give that instruction. But we're not dealing with the jury instruction right now. What I'm dealing with right now is pretrial. The state saying you cannot proceed on battered spouse. There's two avenues in this motion. Avenue one is you cannot proceed with battered spouse because of the factual reasons based on Dr. Harper's deposition as to what she's going to be the basis of her opinion. Battered spouse cannot be entered. Alternatively, you cannot talk about it until there's foundation. That's my takeaway from the state's argument, that before battered spouse is argued or provided or opinion, there has to be that foundation to it. And the linchpin for me is the overt act issue. That how can we have anybody testify to opinions or any of the reputation or specific instances of conduct that we per permitted until that overt act is established? What's your response to that? My response to that, if I'm understanding you correctly, because, if you need to reframe the question, please. Uh, because it's, it's procedurally. There's no way that we could come in here and put Dr. Harper on the stand before Sarah Boone. It just doesn't work. Because we, to even establish the relevancy of, of Dr. Harper's testimony, Sarah Boone, who's the only witness there at the time I agree with that with the state, has to present evidence of self-defense, has to present the evidence of the court talking about that overt act. It's not based on what the doctor perceives or what the doctor was told uh, by Ms. Boone or what questions, what questions were asked at that deposition. I don't know. Mr. Owens took the deposition. The questions, though, at the depositions are limited and the doctor answers. But that's not what this has to be based on. What it has to be based on is what does Ms. Boone, in this case, testifies to on the stand. And if any of that, <coughs> excuse me, if any of that presents a scintilla of evidence to award the self-defense instruction, then the self-defense instruction should be given. That's the first step. Everything follows after that, Judge, because this isn't, this isn't a situation where I think it's appropriate to make a pretrial ruling because the ruling has to be based on the evidence that comes from that witness stand. Now, any of the evidence is subject to cross-examination, impeachment, anything like that, but that's a wait for the jury to determine. But as to the admissibility of the evidence, it has to start with Sarah Boone. A judgment can't be made or a decision cannot be made until the testimony of Sarah Boone takes place at trial. This is just procedurally incorrect. Any other arguments, sir? No other arguments. Thank you. Rebuttal? Yes, sir. This is procedurally correct. Parties are allowed to get motions in limine based on the proffers of evidence that have been made prior to trial. Apparently, opposing counsel has not read the depositions, or, or he clearly didn't attend them because he was not there. Um, but the court has before it the statements that Sarah Boone made when directly asked, what happened that day? What happened next? And there was no overt act taken by the decedent on that particular day. What they want to do, and what is not permissible under the case law that I have cited, 
in particular the one that says you get a threatening text and then two days later you can't go slit somebody's throat because of the threatening text two days earlier. Not to dehumanize Mr. Torres at all, but to give you this analogy. If somebody owns a bad dog and that bad dog bites and that bad dog is bitten in the past, but on this particular day, the dog is just doing arts and crafts and puzzles and hanging out, drinking some Woodbridge Chardonnay, and you put the dog in the suitcase, and then the dog barks because it's in the suitcase and doesn't want to be in the suitcase when it's zipped up. That triggers you to, I remember when the dog bit me in the past. You can't, that's not how this works. That's not how self-defense works with or without battered spouse syndrome. There has to be an overt act. You can't bootstrap and make up a fictitious act of violence on that day based on the past violence. That's not what the case law allows. And the state is asking, unless they are saying that the testimony will be different at trial, we are asking for the court to prevent them from saying anything about this during opening statements, because they will know based on the court's ruling what your client has already said to Drs. Werner and Harper does not admit uh, self-defense evidence into this case. So that's what we're looking for, is that ruling. If this is what the testimony is at trial, then self-defense is not going to apply, and all the ancillary prejudicial things that come with it, reputation evidence, past instances of violence, battered spouse evidence, is not coming in either. Now, if they make some statements and promises that they cannot fulfill, in opening statements, then that will be on them. King versus state will allow us to point those things out to the jury and it will not be burden shifting. But that's what we're asking is, this is a proffer, just like any other proffer testimony, like a sex crimes case where we file a deposition of, of a uh, Williams rule victim and ask the court to rule prior to trial, hey, if this is how the Williams rule victim testifies, and it's clear and convincing, and it meets all the standards under 404 and 403, can this prior act of sexual violence come in during the trial? This is what parties do all the time, is get pretrial rulings on crucial matters like this. This is a crucial matter, because the tip of the iceberg is the second degree murder. The rest of the iceberg, the 99% of what has been going on for the last month and a half, is the self-defense that just isn't there. It wasn't there under her former state, uh, statements to the police, and it's not there under her current statements. So we're asking for a ruling, a motion in limine, which is subject to change based on the evidence at trial. But if this is what the evidence is at trial, the court should not allow um, any of the battered spouse, any of the prior violence, any reputation evidence in. That's all we're asking for. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Just could I respond? Briefly. Yeah. Judge, it is not the responsibility of uh, the defense to present their case uh, at a pretrial hearing. Um, however, but, but the problem is in the state's argument, in the case law, which the case law has been presented by the defense in your filings are not germane to the issue. We're not addressing jury selection and the this, this standard of proof and the burden with regard to self-defense, you establishing a prima facie case and then or, uh, um, the higher standard that the state has to overcome it. There's no dispute as to that. The issue is the necessary predicate to establish battered spouse. And the state's argument is that due to the lack of an overt act based on what Dr. Harper has relied upon, to wit, the multiple interviews or sessions with Ms. Boone, that element seemingly is lacking. We all know what elements are, right? If it's a negligence case, it's duty breach causation. In this case, it's the elements based on the jury instructions are George Torres is dead, she caused the de death, and it was done so in a depraved heart manner. I may have butchered that last element, but those are the elements that need to be established based on the jury instructions. Similarly with self-defense, the case law talks about the overt act. Yes, sir. And then the flashpoint of the defense's argument is that 
the facts which were provided to the expert, who in turn will testify to battered spouse, that flashpoint, that overt act, is lacking. It, it's not, Judge. But I, I find myself in the position now to disclose what our view of the overt act is. Okay. That's okay. what this has put, this is what this motion has put us into. So it's an exercise of the state to learn our theory or our view of the evidence because the overt act is in the physical evidence. And the overt act is mentioned to Dr. Harper in the deposition as to the reaction of Ms. Boone by the overt act. And the overt act, I have to tell you, his hand is coming out of the suitcase. That means he's about to get out of the suitcase. Now, based on history and everything else, she doesn't have to wait to see what's going to happen when he gets out of the suitcase. It's clear what's going to happen when he gets out of the suitcase. It's followed up by physical evidence because there's a picture provided of Mr. Torres's hand that shows a mark on that hand that it matches up with the bat. That's the overt act. It's like a gun, okay? You don't have to wait for them to pull the trigger. You don't. And it's based on all the evidence in the case, just not testimony, but also physical evidence that might support the testimony. Thank you, sir. All right. The court has had the opportunity to review the motions, review all the case law. The state's motion is going to be granted in part and denied in part. With regard to the state's request to exclude battered spouse syndrome evidence outright, the motion is denied. As to specifically Wagner, for the reasons identified in the court's prior rulings as to the concept of argument, again, there's no outright evidence of accident, not argument, excuse me. As to the uh, state's reliance on Lance, L-A-N-T-Z v. State, 263 Southern 3rd, 279. No argument of self-defense was ever offered in that case. I find the cases of Reed v. State, 213 Southern 3rd, 1110. Rudin, R-U-D-I-N v. State, 182 Southern 3rd, 724. State v. Woodson, 349 Southern 3rd, 510. And Morris, 325 Southern 3rd, 1009. Distinguishable as all of those cases were traveling under 776.032 for stand your ground hearings. Um, it's undisputable that an overt act needs to be provided under the Holland case by the Florida Supreme Court, 916 Southern 2nd, 750. Uh, I find the departure from the essential requirements of law argument by the state factually and legally distinguishable as there was a specific uh, statute for the state obtaining medical records as relied upon in Roberts v. State by the 6th ECA in May of 2023, 2023 WL 3262633 at pinpoint site 2. Uh, so for those reasons, the state outright motion to preclude or exclude battered spouse syndrome evidence in toto is denied. With regard to the second portion, that excluding mention of battered spouse syndrome evidence until there's a basis for it, the court's going to rely on LAD and Medina, specifically that there needs to be testimony provided for the expert to testify to the battered spouse syndrome, and there needs to be sufficient predicate established for that self-defense. So I'm going to preclude any mention or testimony in the form of expert testimony as to battered spouse until that necessary predicate as identified in LAD to 564 Southern 2nd 587 has been established. Any questions with regard to the state's ruling? ruling? I'm sorry, the court's ruling, forgive me. Defense. Meaning... You want to mention an opening? You can mention an opening. Certainly I'm going to allow you, and the state at this point has no problem with the concept of battered spouse being addressed in voir dire, and even if the state objected to it, I most likely would overrule it based on the litany of case law that you cited, that you're allowed to dive into those things during jury selection. As to should the defense put on a case, um, the predicate under LAD needs to be established before any expert opines to battered spouse. My concern is open. Can it be mentioned in the Yes. That's, that's your decision. 
That is your decision if you want to mention an opening. There's no preclusion from you doing that. Okay. Any other questions with regard to the court's order on that matter? State. No, Your Honor. Defense. No, Your Honor. Okay, thank you. Moving now to the defendant's motion in limine filed October 6 and the state's response to same. Um, it looks like we've reached some level of common ground with regard to that motion. The court is going to grant the motion with regard to the um, uh, statements on page 69 through 71 of the transcript of the February 25, 2020 interview between Detectives Lowen and Copsell and Miss Boone from page 69, line 6 through page 71. That will be granted to the state not objecting to same. That leaves us to the statements on page 53, line 11, 53, line 13, line 14, page 55, line 24, page 56, line 1, and page 92, line 15. Um, with that, defense, you may proceed with any argument. Similar to the um, last motions, I have reviewed all of y'all's case law. Here, we would like to okay. Uh, the rule of sequestration applies to testimony of other witnesses, not to anything else. Response? Is there going to be testimony? Not from the state. You've got, you've got state witnesses here, you know. She's allowed to be here to watch. I understand, but I want to know whether she's going to testify. I said there's no wait. State witnesses. So that's a no. May proceed with any argument, Mr. Owens. Yes, sir. I have reviewed the 2.8 instruction prior today. Thank you, Counselor. The problem is the state attorney, when they filed the response, they didn't include the highlighted portion that's uh, italicized at the beginning. Police opinions and statements regarding guilt are generally inadmissible and must be redacted from recordings introduced into evidence unless redaction would render the defendant's relevant admissions incomprehensible. If a recorded interview cannot be appropriately redacted, the trial judge must, upon request, give the following limiting instruction immediately before the recorded interview is played for the jury. That section, which is comments directed to the court, was not placed to my understanding, in their response. Okay. Any other argument? Judge, this was a two-hour interrogation that occurred the day or two after the event. And um, the day prior to this time, or that morning, the detectives uncovered the two videotapes, the two-minute video that Sarah Boone had recorded and then followed up 11 minutes later with a 22-second video that she recorded and they found on her phone, which I believe from the interrogation discloses that Sarah did not remember making those recordings. But the purpose of law enforcement's position about having her come in was to interrogate her in an attempt to get a confession from her to the murder. They spent two hours trying to do that any which way they possibly could. And the law says that they're allowed to use, and I cited several cases, I cited the Smith v. State case, the ODEH o -D -E -H v. State case, and the Eugene v. State. And in those cases, uh, I didn't see a citation to Eugene. I mean, Eugene's included in ODA, but I don't... Eugene is uh, found... Do you need the cite? I have it. It's included in ODA, but you did not cite it in your motion. Okay. Um, Eugene is 53 Southern 3rd, 1104. But uh, law enforcement... are entitled to use a variety of interrogation techniques to try to elicit a confession to the crime. Uh, but as in that case, in spite of the detective's efforts, uh, Sarah, Bune, Sarah Boone refused to admit that she was guilty of the murder. But as a 
a last resort, Judge, and it was a two-hour interrogation. It was the last portion, at least the last quarter. It may have been uh, less than that, is when the detectives made some statements that are highly prejudicial to the defendant and tend to be opinion and tend to invade the province of the jury. And that's why this special jury instruction 2.8 recorded interview effective law enforcement statements on the defendant has that italicized portion in there. And the statements we're referring to under my motion, the sec second section of evidence to be excluded, page 53, line 11, well, he's dead as a result of your actions. And then uh, paragraph 9, line 13, he's dead as a result of your actions. She responded, line 14, I understand that. And then paragraph 11, page 55, line 24, I, 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 I have one last question. I just, I mean, you realize you're the person that killed him, right? Sarah, responds on, Sarah Boone responds on page 56, I thought about that. And then lastly on page 92, well, intention or not, here's the detective distinguishing how he interprets the law and her culpability. Well, intention or not, George is dead, and you act like when you say unintentionally, that absolves you from everything. That is exactly the kind of opinion testimony from law enforcement that the courts are worried about. The probative value of that type of opinion testimony about her guilt is outweighed by the prejudicial effect. Thank you. Response. The state stands by the case law that we cited and that the jury instruction uh, that would be read. Uh, I didn't feel it necessary to include italicized portions of comments to the court because this is what would get read to the jury. Um, those statements are designed to get responses from her. They did get responses from her. Let me ask this question first, Mr. J. Do you disagree with counsel's representation of what uh, is reflected in the Q&A at that point in time? To the extent that he is making the argument that they're expressing an opinion about the No, 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 no. the words. Not his opinion, not his thoughts or what it means, but the black and white verbiage is reflected in the motion. Is that what's reflected in the recording? I, I'm accepting that he would not misrepresent that to the court. Okay, thank you. You may continue. Um, and as far as the last line on page 92, line 15, if something's designed to get a response that a normal person would respond to and there's no response, that still makes it a relevant statement. He's not giving an opinion on the law. He's giving an opinion about uh, her reactions to this interview and trying to get a reaction from her when he says, well, intention or not, Jorge is dead. You act like when you say unintentionally, that absolves you from everything. Um, he's not stating that that is a legal defense. He's just commenting on what uh, has transpired in the 92 pages of the interview. Uh, so we defer to whatever the court's ruling is. Okay, thank you. Any rebuttal? Just for the state attorney not to put that in there, the italicized portion, where the Supreme Court is giving instructions to the court with those comments. For them not to put that in there, I disagree with Okay, well, the Jackson speak case speaks for itself, and the court has reviewed it. Thank you. Um, all right. Uh, thank you both for your motion, your um, your motions, your responses, and the case law. Uh, the court is going to grant the defense's motion. I disagree with the defense or with the state, rather, as identified in their response that the only issue is battered spouse. Uh, the issue is one of the elements is cause, and those three statements go specifically, I believe, to opinions as to the cause of um, Mr. Torres's death. So the court is going to grant the state's motion as under the Bush case cited by the state um, law enforcement's opinions are inadmissible due to the prejudicial effect that they may have have. And I do find that this in this expression of law enforcement's opinions as to the guilt of the accused. As such, the motion is granted and those need, will need to be redacted from. I apologize. Thank you. The defense's motion is granted for those reasons. Any questions or clarifications with regard to the court's ruling? State. 
Questions or clarifications with regards to the court's ruling? Okay. Questions or clarifications with regard to the state's ruling? Yes, or the court's ruling, excuse me. Yes, All right, that takes us now to the state's objection and motion and limine to exclude decedent's medical records. I've reviewed that as well. State, you may proceed. Judge, just the other night I received 550 pages of medical records uh, regarding the treatment of Mr. Torres from two incidents, one in 2017 and one in 2018. Um, a third email that I received from Mr. Owens purported he believed that they had attachments. Um, they did not. Uh, I replied to him as such, and I have not gotten any additional emails with attachments regarding the medical records. So for the purposes of this hearing, all I'm arguing about is the 550 pages that I have been provided. Um, one of those instances uh, involved um, a narrative being given by the patient, Mr. Torres, that he had put his hand through a plate glass window. This is the 2018 incident, correct? Yes. yes. Um, and his wife, the following day, made him uh, go in and get treatment. There was a 4.5 centimeter laceration um, that required two sutures. There is no history in the narrative about any violence uh, that the decedent had committed. So I anticipate um, that Ms. Boone, when she testifies, will, will give us an explanation about how this was an instance of past violence uh, that she was aware of uh, by the decedent. So making that assumption then what the state is asking for is the 57 pages uh, seems excessive. This jury is going to have a lot of information to uh, weigh and consider. They don't, not every page of these 57 pages is relevant. What is relevant is, yes, he came in for treatment. That narrative, uh, you know, and the history that he gave of putting his hand through a plate glass window and that he got sutures. That corroborates her testimony. I understand why she will need corroboration for her testimony um, to, to bolster her credibility. Um, so if she testifies that way, we get it, but it's just excessive and, and, and it's going to be confusing. They don't need to read 57 pages of, of all of this treatment. The second batch was 487 pages uh, regarding uh, an incident on Christmas of 2017 when what the decedent reports in the narrative uh, to the hospital is that uh, some unknown men jumped him and beat him up. Um, being a victim of violence uh, is not relevant uh, in this case. Um, I expect there will be a, a story um, based upon the testimony that we've taken from the experts uh, that this all happened at a family gathering and one of the decedent's brothers learned from Sarah Boone um, that uh, Sarah Boone said that he, had, he, the decedent, had committed violence against her and then beat him up. Um, I, that's not the same ilk as corroborating violence with breaking windows or whatever it is that caused his laceration, whatever she ends up testifying to about the 2018 uh, incident. But this incident... It's, it's irrelevant that uh, he got beat up by his brother. Um, it's irrelevant that it, he suffered the amount and severity of injuries that he did. That is not uh, required to corroborate her testimony that, she, I mean, I don't even know if it comes in, that she, she makes an out-of-court statement uh, to the decedent's brother that something is true that happened in the past that seems like classic hearsay. I'm not sure how she would get that in. Um, I don't know that the... 487 pages is needed to corroborate that. Um, and if the court, like I stated in my response, if the court believes that um, it is necessary to corroborate her story that he did get beat up by his brother, then again, there are narrative parts of these medical records. Generally, I would say in this particular instance, it was a handful of pages that give the narrative as to what was happened and I don't know that it's relevant what the treatment was that he received, but there's narratives of that as well. They don't need to be bogged down with 487 pages of toxicology reports, um, nursing rounds, just 
all the things that I'm sure the court is familiar with from your past experience that are in these medical records. Um, it, it's unnecessary um, and it's prejudicial. It, its probative value is, is substantially outweighed by its prejudice, confusing, repetitiveness, as I outlined in my response. So that's our position. Thank you, sir. Response. <clears throat> Judge, as you know, uh, we got on this case about 45 days ago, and there's, I can't tell you how many pages of discovery there is that we've had to go through. And two or three weeks ago, the state attorney provided us over 500 pages from either telephone calls that my client was involved in from the jail or tablet communications, which are kind of like uh, emails or text messages, and that has been narrowed down, but that was given to us. So that's something else we had to stop and go through 500, over 500 pages. And they haven't narrowed that down to which ones they believe are incriminating to her. Okay. Understood. But respectfully, that's not the issue before the court right that. now. But yes, the medical records are going to be narrowed down. And yes, we would have to make some tie to Sarah Boone's testimony to whether or not their medical records of the decedent, George Torres, are admissible to corroborate her stories about the incidences of violence and whether they match up. But yes, I agree there's going to be a narrowing down, but it's kind of premature about that. They've got several volumes. I assume before they introduce something, they're going to have to narrow it down. Do y'all not have, did y'all not have George Torres' medical records prior to me sending them to you? No, no, we didn't. All right, well, we took the deposition of Dr. Harper, and as you know, Judge, these forensic psychologists, when they're trying to make an opinion as to battered spouse or whatever the case may be, they, they rely on their assessment involving the personal um, contact and interviews they have with the client. But a lot of it is any other collateral evidence that tends to support it. That involves arrest reports, that involves court records, that involves psychological uh, notes that involves medical records and at that time when the state took Dr. Harper our witness's deposition she said yes I did rely on Dr. Uh, or George Torres's medical records so they were well aware that doesn't mean they come into evidence I know that I didn't say that but they were well aware that that's one thing that she relied upon a lot of that collateral evidence doesn't come into and it's going to be I need to jump into the breach here I understand all of that I understand that there's been volumes of documents that have been provided between both parties. And I understand, based on my review of, doc of the highlighted portions that the state pointed out in their motion, as to what Dr. Harper relied upon. None of that is germane to the state's argument. And you've admitted that there needs to be a narrowing down. So let's just kind of carpetmentalize what we've it's, got here. So it's premature. I, it's premature. I agree it needs to be narrowed down. And then based on the... Based on Sarah Boone's testimony. You are the proponent of the evidence. Yes. So you have to establish relevance. I agree. And you have to establish that it is not so substantially unfairly prejudicial. Yes. That the prejudice does not outweigh its probative value, including but not limited to the other identifications in 90.403. Yes, sir. So my question is, sir, with regard to the 2018 incident of the fist through the plate glass win window, and I can't recall 40 some odd pages I think the state identified as that, what of those 47 pages is germane to an incident of violence that may be needed to establish the self-defense concept of those 47 pages? It will, be admit it will be relevant after she testifies about that incident. All 47 pages? Maybe not all 47 pages. I've agreed that some of it needs to be narrowed down. Okay, well, what of it needs to be narrowed down, since well, we I, have some level of common ground here? My case is not going to be presented, I would assume, until next week, so I've got a little bit of time. I'll let the state know. Um, That's not how this works. Okay. I can't let you know today, Judge. I'll, I'll, I'll narrow it down, or we'll talk in the next couple of days. Well, the Friday state's position now. is that the narrative should be permitted as to the 2018 incident, the why Mr. Torres was there. But the nursing rounds, the charts, the follow-ups, treatment, anything in the future other than the 4.5 centimeter laceration that required two sutures. I understand the narrative as to what transpired. What else is relevant? And I haven't seen these 47 pages, so I'm not sure there. I'm relying on counsel's representation. I, I don't know. I'd have to look at them. But in one of the medical records, George Torres was over a 0.31 BAC. 
every time... 2018? 2018. I'm talking about the 2018 incident with regard to the plate glass window. I have to look at the records. But there, there is other evidence in those records that's going to be relevant after she testifies. That's when she gets beaten, when he gets really drunk. Or that's when he does something violent or threatens to do something violent when he gets really drunk. In one of those incidences, she, he was over a point three. When he gets over a point two to point three, that's when he gets angry. He's fine up until that point. We're going to establish that. I don't want to put on my defense today, but, Judge, there is going to be relevance to more than just the narrative of those medical records. I'll narrow it down by Friday. That's the best I can do. Okay. What about the 2017 incident, 487 pages, and those documents pertaining to the facial reconstruction and anything thereafter? What does that have to do with anything? Same thing. You know, it's going to be on. It's going to be based on her testimony, and then the judge is going to have to make a decision about whether that's admissible based on her testimony about what happened. But what does the facial reconstruction, surgery, pre-surgery, post-surgery notes have anything to do with whether or not that incident actually took place? That's going to depend on Sarah Boone, depending on what her testimony is, and you'll have to find based on that whether or not that's relevant and probative to the case. That's not how motions in limine work. I don't know what else to tell you, Judge. Uh, she's going to have to testify, and then we'll make the arguments as to the admissibility of that. I'm struggling with understanding how... I can understand BAC results. I can understand that, based on Dr. Harper's deposition. I can understand uh, the narrative as to why they were there. I don't know what are all in these records. What does nursing rounds or pre-op, post-op of facial reconstruction surgery have anything to do with an incident that purportedly took place on December 24th, 2017? How is it relevant? Some of those may not be. Some of, the, some of the records may be relevant, depending on Sarah Boone's testimony about how what happened to him was tied to what he did to her. Okay. Anything else? That's it. Response? The two parties' discovery responsibilities in a criminal matter are not equal. The state of Florida has a duty to disclose anything that anybody knows or may reasonably be calculated to lead to relevant information to the defense. The defendant's obligation is to let us know what they're going to use in trial. So for them to come in today on the third day of jury selection and to tell us that it's premature to ask for what is going to be their actual evidence in a trial is wrong. They got these records, and I understand that they're the ninth set of attorneys for Ms. Boone, but the defendant got these records in 2022 or 2021, and they just get disclosed to me overnight a couple of nights ago. Um, in their discovery responses, in the First Amendment, Second Amendment, third, so on and so forth, for weeks, they were telling us that they didn't have them and they were waiting for them, but they were sitting in Miss Boone's box, apparently, that um, Billy Lane had acquired um, years ago. So it's not premature to ask, and it's not unfair to ask for what is going to be introduced in this case or attempted to be introduced, particularly given the court's rulings. We had rulings from this court, I think you entered it August 5th or August 6th, setting forth a schedule for what are you both? In the state, state too, we, we both disclosed what are we actually introducing. The state has actually narrowed down the digital phone evidence of, from uh, the defendant greatly to about 160 pages of the PDF from the thousands that it was. Um, and and handful and dozen, a few dozen pictures and videos. We have done everything we can to narrow it down. Um, we're not asking for much here. We're not asking for much. And just to, to bring the point about the BAC, Jorge Torres had a 342 medical blood, so there's probably some conversion, 10-15% for legal blood, um, at the time that he was admitted for his facial injuries. That would be a different picture than um, on the date of the plate glass window. 
On that date, again, I expect that the testimony from the defendant will be that he was the aggressor, the violent one, and his blood alcohol level would be relevant for the plate glass window one. But I'm struggling to understand what his BAC's relevance is if we're all at a family gathering at the Torres's and she says something that triggers one of his brothers to violently beat him nearly to death, what his BAC's relevance is on that particular occasion, unless her testimony is there, the decedent was being violent with her that day, and that's just not my understanding of how the depositions read. So, Judge, we're, we're not asking for much. I don't think Friday's su sufficient. We're attaching jeopardy to this case as soon as we swear this panel in, hopefully tomorrow morning. Thank you. Thank you. All right. The court has reviewed the motion and has reviewed both the arguments. I I'm struggling with the relevance on some of these things. So I'm going to grant the court the state's motion in part to the factual narratives as to why Mr. Torres was seeking treatment. That will be admissible. I'm going to overrule the state's objection with that, and I think they've conceded that that is relevant. Information regarding blood alcohol content in both the December 24, 2017 incident, the December or the 2018 incident, I find potential relevance. So I'm going to overrule the state's objection with regard to those. However, the balance, I'm going to sustain the state's objection and grant their motion in limine unless there's evidence provided in the defense's case in chief that make these other documents relevant. Because at this point in time, it is unclear to me how the balance of other hospital records, nursing rounds, pre-op, post-op, the surgery itself from the 2017 incident are relevant to a fact of consequence be it any of the material allegations the state needs to establish or any material allegations the defense needs to establish for the purposes of self-defense. Yes. I'm not foreclosing you, but there needs to be something for you to link these documents together for me. All right. Any um, clarification or questions with regard to the state's rule or the court's ruling? No, defense. No, All right. Thank you. That now takes us to... Um, the objections to the evidence. <coughs> Give me a moment. <coughs> we have the defendant's objections to state's digital exhibits filed October 15th. The state's amended, or state's, excuse me, state's response to defendant's fifth amended reciprocal discovery exhibit list filed also on October 15th. I have reviewed these. I'm a little bit of a loss in the state's response because I don't know what items one, two, et cetera, are. It just identifies them. I'm not sure what, what it is that they are. Um, it's tracking their fifth amended exhibit list. As I pointed out before, it got really confusing because as they added things, it would not go to the end of the list. It would get put into the middle of the list. So I started over, scrapped my first response to the first amended one, scrapped my second response to the second amended one, both of which were filed on September 27th in a timely manner. And um, this is why my uh, paragraphs start with zero in my response, because they have a paragraph 1A, and then they list the items, and I wanted to make it very easy and clear for the court uh, to just be able to flip to what paragraph I'm talking about for each item tracking their fifth amended exhibit list. But here's the, the problem that I'm having. On September 27th, I see the notice of provision of defendant's third amended exhibit list. When was the fifth amended exhibit list provided? That might be a problem with um, them not filing things with the clerk of the court. Okay. Um, I'm getting copies of some pleadings, but they're not... Uh, bait stamped with the clerk of the court's uh, e-filing system on the top left, so I'm not certain that the cl they've filed anything with the clerk of the court. Here's the other problem that I have. All I have, all I see on my end is the notice of providing. It doesn't identify anything. It's a one-page document. So it's hard for me to say what, I know you may have seen it, but the court hasn't seen it based on what's been filed. That's a I believe I would direct to any questions about why that's not filed with the clerk of the court to the defense. Okay. All right. I need clarification, Mr. Owens, as to when the fifth amended reciprocal discovery exhibit list was filed and what is in it. 
because the notice that I see in the court file from September 27th is just a notice. It doesn't identify anything for me to line up item one and item one as to what they purport to be. You're asking for when it was filed? We're checking on that. When it was filed, what was, this, what was the next question? All I have is a notice. So on September 27th, there was a notice of provision of defendant's third amended exhibit list. And it's just that. What we intend on utilizing has been provided. But I don't have anything else as to what those items are. Okay. Did you want us to provide you with a copy of those to your JA? Or you can send it to Madam Clerk and she can print it out to me. Because I, I'm having difficulty lining up what these things are because all I have in the court file is this was sent on this day, but I don't know what any of these things are. We can move on to something else and let me get it. Unless we've got some housekeeping matters to address for this afternoon, um, but unless I'm missing something, the only other thing that we've got teed up to address this morning is the objections. Okay. Um, let me, give me one second. All right. Um, I got an email this morning from Juror Services. Juror number 551. I don't recall from what panel. Um, no, I'm sorry. Juror number 471, panel 3, seat 48. Tested positive for COVID, uh, and jury services has instructed him not to return. Uh, Juror number 551. What was the Who first, was the first one? one? Sure. Juror number 471, panel 3. That would have been yesterday morning, seat 48. Advised jury services this morning that he was not feeling well. After leaving the courthouse, he tested positive for COVID. I have instructed jury services to excuse him because we don't need that floating around. The other juror, 551, I don't have any other information as to what panel or seat. Um, she took a COVID test and was negative. She is planning on reporting today. So due to the um, shrinking from 54 to 53, jury selection will take place here in 12 Alpha this afternoon as opposed to the 23rd floor. The deputies have already brought in additional chairs so that we can fit 53 people in here. That's the only other housekeeping matters that I have to address. So, are there any housekeeping matters to address from the state before we address the objections issues? Is it wise to not utilize that expanded space when two of these panels, or at least one of these panels, has already been exposed to COVID up in the 23rd floor? <laughs> Would it not be wise to use the bigger space in 23 since one of our panels has already potentially been exposed to COVID um, as opposed to packing everybody in like sardines. Response. I don't know the layout of 23, so I... Can you all approach just for a second?
All right, court's going to take a 15-minute recess uh, to address jury selection location this afternoon um, and to give the defense the opportunity to provide the uh, most the fifth amended exhibit list. With regard to juror 551, what say the state? No objection to the, uh, well, I, if he doesn't have COVID, then I, I don't have a motion for cause. Okay. Any response from the defense? Correct. That is correct. I read you what was provided to me. Okay. Court's going to be in a 15 minute recess. Thank you. You ready? We're back on the record. 2020 CF 2603, State of Florida versus Sarah Boone. State. Dave Kester on behalf of the state. William J for the state. Defense. James Owens from the state. Tony Henderson for Sarah Boone. Ms. Boone is still seated at council's table wearing the same gray suit and white blouse from this morning. Um, can you approach?
All right, court's going to step out for one second, and then uh, uh, you can email that exhibit list to Madam Clerk, and then we can go from there. Thank you. All right, we're back on the record, 2020 CF 2603, State of Florida versus Sarah Boone. Uh, state, let me get appearances. David Ketchatron, Patton State. William J. for the State. Defense. James Owens for Ms. Boone. Tony Henderson for Ms. Boone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry. Uh, thank you. Ms. Boone is still seated at council's table with the same clothing from this morning. All right, I've been provided by Madam Clerk, defendant's fifth amended reciprocal discovery exhibit list. Um, I haven't had the opportunity to review it yet, but it is in my hands. Let's start with the defendant's objections to state's digital exhibits. I'll turn it over to you, Mr. Owens. Judge, and I did want to say that the notice of provision of the defendant's fifth amendment exhibit list was e-filed on October 3rd, defendant's fifth amendment exhibit list was emailed to the state on October 3rd. Correct, but the, the same problem I have is it's just the notice of provision. I don't know what any of the substance was. All right, you may proceed, sir. Judge, I'm going to handle this. Okay, go ahead. And Judge, this was a little bit of a new procedure because uh, I tried. What I did was review the images and. Um, these, as in the motion, we object to all the cell phone photo evidence. The state in, uh, tends to introduce a trial as to, I'm not going to know until I hear evidence or see when they're trying to induce, introduce it, if it's relevant or not at that time. Something might make something relevant at a certain time or it might not make it relevant. So there. And also as to just the foundational stuff, because the images, as I've seen it, I don't have dates, so I don't know when it was taken in relation to the February 23rd, 2020 date, uh, which is the date of the offense, and so I'm at a loss for that. So I don't know if it's two years before, does that make it relevant? If it's three years before, I don't know. So that's going to be, if, if the foundation is laid, that's my problem with these photograph exhibits is I don't know until I hear who's trying to put it in, how's it identified, and if the proper foundation is made to make it relevant. Okay. Response? going to be considered a separate hearing for the record so should this be D or should it be a all everything was when I called what was being heard today it was all in the same hearing so I believe it should be pre-marked as D <clears throat> What I'm having, Madam Clerk, mark as D for identification for purposes of this hearing is what has been provided to the defense as the very narrowed down portion of the phone extraction carve out. What it has is what, and we were even so specific that we labeled one part of the PDF case in chief pages, of which there are 59. We labeled rebuttal pages, of which there are 108. 
attachments that go to the case in chief timeline. Count up as 80 photographs and videos. Attachments and rebuttal. Count up as 147 photographs and videos. Um, there is metadata that comes with all those files. So there is a date stamp and time stamp on each of those files. For instance, 12 25 2019 1 10 p.m. Another one might be 10 26 slash 2019 6 06 p.m. They all have file names. Um, providing uh, context um, would be the PDF outlook uh, or uh, PDF um, uh, outline of the phone extraction of which the state will now move into evidence so that the court consider this um, as states four for the purposes of these hearings. Any objection to what was pre-marked as D? Right, that will receive without objection as states four. So just to give the court an example. On page 49 of 59 of the PDF uh, labeled Case in Chief, entry 31107 in this PDF uh, from the phone extraction is labeled Videos, 223-2020, 11, 12 p.m., 45 seconds, UTC minus 5, which means corrected to Eastern Standard Time for that time of year and it's image underscore 1062.mov. So that sort of information is going to be there for the majority of these files. Um, the ones that end up getting recovered from unallocated deleted space are sometimes not going to be there. Um, but there will be contextual clues as to their relevance. The court will be able to see that. Um, so for instance, that image is the two-minute infamous video of Mr. Torres being in the suitcase that started at 11, 12 p.m., 45 seconds on February 23rd. So there is context that can be used both on the metadata that's in the file when you list these files by details instead of by icon, and then within the timeline. And what we have carved out is the case in chief timeline has a conversation that begins on Christmas of 2019, and it starts um, with Mo, uh, presumably um, the decedent's brother, uh, having a conversation with Sarah Boone, the owner of the phone, and it culminates in hide and seek, I shall. That's the context of that conversation on December 25th. Mm -hmm. Then it goes down to conversation that's going on January 12th into the 13th of January of 2020 culminates in a text from the owner of the phone saying and bless you and all of you too I'll get capitals rid of him so that's the context of those uh, portions of our case in chief uh, PDF and then there's just the timeline uh, that starts with February 23rd, 2020 at 8.35 in the morning and goes through the entire day to give context of what is going on with her on the phone. Is she using it? When is she presumably awake? Um, that's the context of that file. The rebuttal file, which is, again, 108 pages, it starts, uh, and it basically involves with conversations with or about the, the, the decedent, um, conversations with his family, um, which I anticipate um, the defendant is going to testify she was terrified of, and there were problems with all the time. It's going to give some context 
uh, to those things. Um, it mentions when they became a relationship on Facebook of March 8th of 2018 to give context as to when perhaps this relationship started or not. And then there's a timeline that starts from May 21st, 2019, um, that is filled with conversations about and with the decedent. At that point in time, he had his own phone, and then at some point he doesn't. And the discussions and the arguments between him and the family with the defendant. And then the images that are associated in the folders, case in chief and rebuttal, are the ones that are associated in these time frames. Um, I have cleared out the vast majority of them. The vast majority of them were just icons and things that belong to games and nonsense. I cleared out all the photographs of uh, Mr. and Mrs. Boone's child, um, his, any of the child's uh, friends, there, there was no need for any of the pictures of the children. Um, it's mostly photographs of the decedent and the defendant, but there's also just pictures of art uh, and them going out because it gives context. You know, if she's in the middle of an argument, for instance, with the family, um, you know, one might expect there to be pictures of injuries. Instead, there's pictures of art. Um, so we did our best to, to select which photographs and videos um, were pertinent within these time frames. We did our best to narrow it down to what time frames we set. We believe we'll give a good rebuttal picture after she testifies about his family and her relationship with him. Um, so that's where we're at. So as far as uh, the relevancy, the general relevancy uh, objection that was made, uh, there was no specificity as to what particular entries in the, the PDFs are um, <clears throat> objectionable for any particular reason. Um, we believe that everything is relevant. Um, again, we are submitting it for the court's review. I know that we're on the third day of jury selection, which will apparently resume in 81 minutes. Um, if there's an authenticity issue, because one of their objections was relevancy, foundation, unknown origin date, hearsay, and Crawford issues, um, I'm submitting for the court, if I can approach the court. Gilbert versus State, 324 Southern 3rd, 598 from the 2nd District Court of Appeal decided in 2021. <clears throat> Lamb versus State, 246 Southern 3rd, 400 from the 4th District Court of Appeal decided in 2018. Gale, G-A-Y-L-E, versus State, 216, Southern 3rd, 656, 4th District Court of Appeal case as well from 2017. The basics of these three cases are just the very low bar for authenticity. Um, as Professor Earhart from Florida State University would tell us, authenticity is a very low bar for the court. Um, it is generally considered a matter of weight for the trier of fact. And with this digital evidence, it can be established and authenticated in a variety of ways. What the state expects the evidence is going to be is that the uh, defendant's phone was taken from her home by law enforcement, as we know from the motion to suppress, and it was provided to a digital forensic examiner who was able to uh, use the defendant's passcode to unlock it and perform a digital extraction. Um, so that should clear up most of the authenticity issues as to who the owner of the phone is. The state readily concedes and has provided context by using extra pages of conversations that at some point the decedent no longer had his own phone and was using uh, Miss Boone's phone from time to time. And in fact, that is part of her allegations about uh, pornography and, and contacting other women. Um, but I believe the context of those conversations makes it clear who is using the phone and who is not using the phone. So we believe that there is no foundation issue. Um, we believe, based on the defense they are raising, that there um, is relevancy. We have s split it up to the case in chief and the rebuttal. We are specifically only entering the two incriminating statements in the context of those incriminating statements about hide and seek and getting rid 
of him plus the timeline of the date of the offense. Then uh, the rebuttal, we have carved it out as best we could to uh, present a picture of the conversations and the tone, as much as tone can be inferred from texts, um, and how the relationship was with the family and who may or may not have been the psychological aggressor. As far as hearsay and Crawford issues, I am unclear if they are talking about just in general the digital forensic extraction report itself. One of the cases I gave to you uh, makes it clear that machines are not humans. Um, they do not uh, get subjected to uh, Justice Scalia's version of the Confrontation Clause that he outlined in Crawford versus Washington in 2004. Um, what he also talked about, though, and what has had some discussion since the Crawford decision was What's hearsay versus testimonial hearsay? Um, obviously, there's no testimonial hearsay in these phone extractions. There is no implication that any of, any of these statements made by any of the participants in the text conversations uh, were doing so with an eye towards litigation or prosecution. Um, so it's the state's position, number one, that the extraction itself and all the data that is coming from it is not uh, hearsay and is not testimonial hearsay, much less. Um, and the conversations that are going on with the other people, the, the statements that other people are making back to the defendant in the carve-out that we've provided aren't being offered for the truth of the matter asserted. Um, there is no hearsay issue. It is to provide the context of the things that the defendant is saying. Um, I'm going to go bond Jorge out. I'm going to go to the public defender's office and, and get this taken care of. Um, or screaming at his family, so on and so forth, um, demanding immediate responses when somebody's cutting hair and keeps on telling her repeatedly, I can't respond to you, I can't respond to you, I'm working. Um, so those sorts of things, I, it's the state's position, aren't being offered for the truth of the matter asserted. Um, as far as the unknown origin date, uh, I think it's pretty clear from the PDF uh, <coughs> timeline that there is a date and timestamp to every single entry from this phone extraction. And that corroborates with the images, most of the images, some, some were from unallocated space, um, but it corroborates the, the metadata uh, for these images. So we're asking for that their um, motion uh, or their objection to be denied preliminarily. Obviously, we have to lay the predicate properly at, at um, trial, but now the court has a copy and hopefully we can get uh, advice from the court if the court is believing that there are sustainable objections before we swear in the jury um, so that the state can pull any photographs or videos or we can have at least a discussion about those specifics and then after discussing those specifics um, the state can pull those out before burning a DVD to provide the, um, uh, the jury. Um, we also have the ability to black out entries in the PDFs Again, no specific objections were made, so it would be our position that they're waived. There was a generalized uh, objection, but so that we're not doing this when the jury is out. Um, trial is busy enough. Trial is tedious enough to not be conducting discovery and doing redactions uh, during the nights and mornings of trial. Thank you. Thank you. Response. Judge, I think this procedure calls for a lot of speculation as to the defense part, as to what uh, these photos, examples of the photographs, what's the use of this photograph? There's a piece of art on the wall. I don't know how that's relevant to the case. So without knowing how it's relevant and what their theory is of it being relevant, I have to on the objection. I, I don't think this is relevant. What's your response to the lack of specificity? That these are just boilerplate objections to all photographs, all video? Yes, well, they're not to all photographs and all, all videos. There are, there are things that we listen It is an objection to all cell phone photo evidence the state intends to introduce. Correct. It is objections to all cell phone video evidence the state intends to introduce. Because at this point in time, Judge, I can't tell you what the independent um, objection would be. I don't know how it fits into their theory of the case. 
that's cause for me to speculate how it fits into their theory of the case. How can I do that? If they say, if they show you a picture, like a picture of artwork, all right, I don't know how that's relevant to this case or a conversation that takes place to between two other people. At the time, I don't know how it's relevant to the case. So what am I supposed to say? No objection to it? And then am I later barred from objecting to it when I don't think it fits so they hadn't laid the foundation to get it in? It's, it's putting the cart before the horse. That pertains to the rebuttal evidence. What about the evidence that was outlined that the state intends on using in its case in chief? That's, that's it, Judge. How do I know they are going to be able to lay the proper foundation for that evidence? How do I know? That's the thing when the, go, when the well, I think the procedure goes like this. Yeah, I could be wrong, but I don't think so. The procedure goes like this. The state has a piece of evidence. They have that evidence identified to someone. All right? They get it marked as an exhibit. Okay, at a certain point in time, the state asks if we can introduce, we'd like to introduce exhibit number one into evidence. Defense, either objection or no objection at that time. I've heard the witness who've identified it. I know what it is at that time, and I have some relationship to it at that time to make the proper objection. Just getting a picture now, and I'm supposed to say um, no objection. I don't know what they're using it for. Guess what, Judge? The videos of the suitcase, we didn't object to those. Do you know why? It was clear. I know when it was, and I know the purpose of using it. But when you have animate objects on the wall or pictures of individuals, and in, in this case, there, I, but, but what I'm reading, it sounds like you're objecting to those. All cell phone video evidence that the state intends to introduce. Correct. Sounds like it covers the suitcase video to me. All no, means the, all. The the suitcase video is listed in one of the in the things that we don't object to. I don't know that. I have image underscore o nine five four. I don't know what that is. Image underscore o nine eight zero. I don't know what that is. Okay. I'm just looking at the words on the paper. How does it need to be done, Judge? Well, the the what the state is asking for is a preliminary ruling on these objections. How do you how do you have a preliminary ruling on an objection when the foundation or anything has not been laid in court for evidence being admitted? The state conceded they need to lay the appropriate foundation. Well, it was part of their argument. Okay, so I'm, I'm I'm not going to address foundation if they're able to establish it is what it purports to be under the case law under ninety point nine zero one and everything else. I mean, he's right. It's a low bar for what admissibility is. And I have no problem with that. Okay. I have no problem with that part, Judge. The, the thing that I'm saying is uh, I want to make sure because I didn't object to something on here, it waives my right to object to it later. Okay. That's what this sounds like to me. It sounds like this is a situation, well, Mr. Henderson, you didn't object to this on the state's list of exhibits. You did not object to it. You can't object to it now. I don't think that's fundamentally correct. So I don't know what part I'm missing. Anything else, sir? Well, uh, yes, Judge, I would like because I know it's a different jurisdiction. People do things differently. Okay? 30 years. I've never had to do this in a criminal case. Okay. Part of the reason the court issued the order back in August is at that point in time, Ms. Boone was representing herself pro se. And we need to establish deadlines to prevent any ambush or last minute issues. Then you all parachuted in on August the 30th. Yes. There was no order. There was no request to vacate any of those deadlines. So those deadlines were still in full force and effect. Yes, sir. But the reason behind that was because Ms. Boone at that time was representing herself pro se and to avoid issues at trial, the court had set a schedule for when certain objections needed to be provided. And I understand your position. I don't want to be in a position where I'm deemed to have waived anything. I get it. But the state's proffer seems to have established some level of relevancy for these things. And as we well know, the bar for relevancy is very, very low. As to foundation, I agree with you. And the state concedes that point. They need to establish the appropriate foundation. 
And if they're able to do that, I'm not foreclosing you for making objections, but as of this point in time, your objections are preserved for the purposes of trial. You can raise them, certainly. But at this point in time, based on the state's proffer of what they intend to use and why they intend to use it, I'm going to find that it's relevant and not repetitive. Judge, I, at this point in time, as a pretrial ruling, as a pretrial ruling that doesn't waive my right to object to something as they're trying to admit it based on relevancy, foundation, or any of those things, then I don't have a problem with that. What my concern was, the way this looked like to me, if that if I didn't make an objection to it at this time for this, I am waiving it at trial. I understand. Any uh, clarifications or questions with regard to the court's ruling? We're, we're just, I believe we're trying to treat this like a video interview redaction issue. Like, it takes time to go back and pull out pictures and pull out videos or black out lines or remove pages. That's all we're trying to do is do that today. I don't know what the defense expects to be different at trial, what more information they're going to learn uh, from the digital evidence. I mean, the foundation for this evidence is going to be the law enforcement officer that took the phone that is pictured in the CSI photos out of Ms. Boone's apartment. It's right on the nightstand next to the suitcase. And then that person is going to have to testify, well, I gave it to Junella Wadden. And then Junella Wadden is going to come in and bring the phone with her and say, this is the phone that I plugged into my Magic Cellbrite software or whatever she used on that particular day. And this is how Cellbrite works. This is my educational background, blah bitty blah bitty with this software. And I pulled this extraction out. Mr. J sent me this carve out of this extraction before trial. In fact, she picked it up yesterday. Um, and I... I believe, you know, I'm going to testify that this is part of the larger carve-out. This is from her phone. That's going to be the foundation. The rest of these things are things that we should be able to have an intelligent discussion about today with specificity about this is, this line of text isn't okay. This particular photograph's not okay for this reason. That's what we were hoping for. Okay. Have you reviewed what it is that they, the state intends on eliciting in this exhibit? Yes, Judge, this is the things that I re reviewed. I sat down last night and went through every one of them preparing for this hearing. What we did not, or what we failed to do because of the time restraint for the ones that we didn't list the number and I didn't give detail as to like IMG uh, 0954, what it represents. My concern is this. Because I don't have a problem with this or with the state's evidence at this time, as long as it's not a bar, that when we come into court and I feel something is not relevant at that time, or they go to admit it and I say, objection, relevancy, or objection, foundation, that I'm not barred at that time. I don't know any rule that would bar me at that time. Okay. I'm going to overrule your objections for the reasons that I previously identified. You can raise your objections at trial if you deem necessary. But based on the state's proffer, I'm going to find that the uh, different categories of documents that he's identified as reflected in Exhibit 4 are relevant. They are not repetitive. They are not cumulative. Um, and so long as they can establish the appropriate foundation and based on counsel's proffer, seems like they might be able to do so. Any questions, sir? Now, I just want to add something for the record. Yes, sir. Uh, the state doing its proper said there were no photos of the child. That's not correct. There are photos of the child. That are being sought into evidence? Yes, Your Honor. State? Response? If any? <clears throat>
I don't believe so in either of the folders. I don't have any independent recollection if I tidied it up more than when I gave them what I believe the exhibit to be a week or two ago, but I don't see any. Okay, I see two images. I couldn't recognize it as reflection of children in a, I don't know if it's a snow globe and an aquarium or whatnot, but I have no uh, objection to removing those two. I just didn't recognize it as children. I recognize it as a crab. I haven't seen the picture, so I'm at a loss. Well, I'm sorry, it's Judge. Extraordinary file name, but um, I don't, I'm going to remove those two. Okay. I take care of that issue for you, that, sir. That takes care of that issue, Judge. Okay. But the point that I'm trying to make with that and why I raised it is that there are going to be certain things that I'm not going to know and to what is the purpose of it as far as how is it, how is it relevant now. They can make a proffer. I understand they can make a proffer, but their proffer is in evidence. Once it goes up, the witness is in all, and the court has told me that I don't waive my objection, so I understand the court's ruling. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Yes. Anything else with regard to the defendant's objection to state's digital exhibits, Mr. Henderson? No, Your Honor. Okay. Moving now to the defendant's fifth amended reciprocal discovery exhibit list and the state's objections to same. There are some for which the state has no objections. Those need not be addressed. It will just be dealing with the <clears throat> objections outlined. It is not lost on the court that it is 1230. We do have a jury coming in an hour. My, my court staff does need a lunch break. So how do you want to proceed, Mr. J? I just want a ruling before we swear in the petite panel. Okay. Do you have any concerns with proceeding with jury selection this afternoon? And the final portion of the court's inquiry, 
as addressed yesterday and turning it over to you without having a ruling on these and we could address these objections tomorrow morning before we bring in the balance of our panel all right is that acceptable to the defense okay all right so then here's what we're going to do we're going to be in recess till 1 30. we will report to the 23rd floor i've already advised jury services and court admin that a room is available for us we will uh, continue jury selection at that time I will keep you apprised of whether or not we can continue jury selection in 23 tomorrow. As soon as I have that information, I or my judicial assistant will pass it along to you. Assuming we're in 23, we will advise the jurors when they need to return and we can address all these objections tomorrow. Um, and we'll address those objections either in 23 or in 12 alpha. Anything further from the state? No, Your Honor. Anything further from the defense? Okay. We will see you all at 1.30 and 23. Thank you.